Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 27th meeting of 2017. There are no apologies. Agenda item one is civil litigation, expenses and group proceedings, Scotland bill. And it's our second evidence session on this bill. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerks, and paper two, which is a spice paper. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the committee Ronnie Conway, who is the coordinator of the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers, Brian Castle, Regional Coordinator Scotland of Motor Accident Solicitors Society, and Patrick Maguire, partner with Thompson's Solicitor. Um, can I thank all the witnesses for the written submissions? That's extremely helpful for the committee. And we'll move straight to questions, starting with uh, John Finney. Good morning, panel, and thank you for your, your, your submissions. I wonder, panel, if you're able to outline whether uh, damage-based agreements have any advantages over no one, no fee arrangements, please. Um, I'm, I'm happy to begin answering that question. I think, um, Mr. Finney, uh, the reality is that, that the terms, particularly uh, in this bill, are entirely interchangeable. What the bill does uh, is. Um, legalise, uh, because until now professional rules and otherwise have prevented solicitors entering into the type of arrangement whereby, in the event of success, a specific percentage of damages uh, could be taken as a fee at the end of that successful case. Uh, until now, there had been a, a very specific form of a speculative fee agreement that a solicitor could enter that centred around uh, being able to um, charge a percentage increase uh, in damages. This bill has simply sought to um, make things simpler uh, for practitioners, but I think most importantly uh, for victims of accident, injury and disease, in order that they uh, can have a very clear picture in their mind when they decide if they are going to take a claim forward and which uh, solicitor they choose uh, to engage in that process. I think it's about simplicity, clarity, and for that, uh, I think it is a, a good and welcome addition to the law. Yes, I'd maybe pick up on that, that as well. Um, at the moment where um, a client engages with a solicitor on a written speculative fee agreement, um, there's no clear understanding on the client's part how much they're going to be charged at the end of the day because a solicitor under the rules as they stand at the moment um, can charge up to 100% of judicial expenses that they recover at the moment. Now, that, that you know even a solicitor at the outset of a case can't tell a client um, what the judicial expenses are likely to be. So um, in terms of certainty, a, a client can readily understand under a um, damages-based agreement that there is a percentage. Um, and a, a, as, as Paddy said, I think it just makes things simpler so far as they go. And the proposals here um, in terms of Taylor is to um, to cap those um, cap those success fees or to cap a DBA so that they're not um, uh, they're not going to take an inordinate amount of damages from clients. But certainty is there, and I suppose also um, clients will like the idea. I think that um, if a solicitor is fighting their corner and um, can charge a, a, a fee based on the actual recovery. They, they, they've got an interest in fighting for the best, best deal for the client there. Thank you. Mr Finney, uh, I would agree with what has been said by my colleagues up, up until now. Uh, Taylor looked at this, looked at the fact that there are many, or, or there are some of the larger firms of solicitors who have a, a kind of parallel type claims management uh, company and that clients were already offered a, a damages-based uh, agreement. In the main, Taylor found that the clients were perfectly happy with it. The existing rules on speculative fees are Byzantine, incapable of being understood, it seems to me, by um, members of the public. And I, I, I have to say, there is an, I, I, I don't have any factual basis for saying that there has been abuse. But at present, they are open to abuse. And it seems to me that this bill is a substantial improvement on the current position. 
Thank you. Then, panel, in a damage-based agreements were to be introduced, where, where would that leave the no win, uh, no fee arrangement? A, a, a damage-based agreement, Mr. Finney, is just a form of no win, no fee agreement. Uh, it is one that simply um, has clarity, so that the basic building blocks are the same. That the solicitor will act and will only charge a fee in the event of success. It's simply what happens in the event of success that under uh, this bill um, that the uh, uh, success fee will be at a fixed and clear from the outset uh, percentage. Whereas at the moment, as colleagues have described, uh, there's a, a very strange, and I agree with Mr Conway's view, Byzantine uh, approach in terms of fees uplift. So it's just a matter of clarifying. No win, no fee is simply a generic term uh, in damage-based agreements as a form of that. The bill actually still allows as I think uh, Hamish Goodall explained uh, last week, still allows solicitors to uh, engage in the old-fashioned speculative fee agreements if they so choose. I would be surprised if any do, but the bill allows that still to happen. Is there confusion about the terminology, or is it perhaps the lack of clarity on my part here? Because it's, to the layperson, it doesn't necessarily seem straightforward. The, uh, the terminology in the bill? Yeah. I think members of the public um, view, uh, for them, the issue is no win, no fee. I feel like that's, that's the common parlance that they uh, expect to be able to go to a solicitor, to engage that solicitor, and to be only charged a fee in the event of success. That is what currently happens, but the rules that govern what a solicitor can charge um, uh, is not clear in the main. Um, there is an unlevel uh, playing field because claims companies uh, and certain uh, organisations of solicitors who are allied to claims companies can engage in the type of arrangement that uh, is currently being uh, envisaged for all under this bill, the damage based type agreement that you're talking about, Mr Finney, that at the moment only a very limited number of organisations can say in the event of success the fee will be X percent. Most solicitors cannot do that. So all the bill does is allow everyone to operate in the same way, in a way that's entirely clear to the public. And to take your point, that's exactly what the public expect and need in any event. They want to know that there will be no charge in the event of the case being unsuccessful, and they want to know, I think, what that charge will clearly be in the event of success. The bill sweeps away, I think, the confusion, and the market will uh, balance out and determine that. Mr. Finney, I wonder also if part of the answer relates to the regulations which have still to be uh, made and I think are subject to affirmative procedure. Uh, Taylor looked closely, and I should declare an interest that I was part of the Taylor reference, <coughs> uh, reference group, although I did not write a single word. It, Mr. Chair Principal Taylor is the only begetter of the Taylor uh, review. But he, he, he looked that, that there are uh, provisions Within, the, uh, within his recommendations about just precisely what Mr uh, Maguire said about clarity for members of, of the public so that there will be a fixed format of agreement which members of the public uh, will have access to. And I, I suspect that within a very short period of time, speculative fee action, the, speculative, the kind of speculative fee agreements that we've been speaking of up until now will wither on the vine. Points that, that um, John uh, Finney was raising and that you've clarified, Mr. McGarry, is that no win, no fee can come in various forms. It's a generic term, and the bill sets out precisely um, a, a formula for this. Um, had we still to hear from Mr. Did I interrupt you, Mr. Castle? No, no, no. Um, right, Stuart, a supplementary? Uh, yes. Excuse my voice. Um, Mr. Castle, you. Uh, spoke with approbation about the solicitor having an interest in the outcome financially. Is that really a good thing in that historically the solicitor has been in, in representing their client, of course, but independent from the interests of their client and able to provide independent advice and had duties to the court itself? Now, I accept the train may well have left the station on this subject, but I just wonder uh, if uh, 
the solicitors having a financial interest of the kind you describe, which you appear to speak of approvingly, is actually a good thing under any circumstance? Well, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, I think I'm talking on behalf of the client, and when, it, when we were talking in the context of looking at damages-based agreements <coughs> and the potential benefit to a client, then I, th I think the client does or would see that as a good thing if the solicitor was fighting the corner and had an interest to do well and secure full and proper compensation for the client. But Traditionally, um, you're right, and there were, you know, the, the, the laws that stands preventing solicitors at the moment from directly um, entering into a, um, a contingency fee agreement with the client. Um, the rule was there because of the, the concerns traditionally. Now, um, Sheriff Principal Taylor looked at that, um, took account, I think, in terms of his review about those concerns, but I think on balance, had recommended that actually, for the sake of clarity and certainty at the outset of a, an agreement and a, a client entering into um, you know, an agreement with a solicitor, they knew at the outset um, what the terms of that agreement were going to be in terms of a, a charging regime. Uh, would you therefore, and it may be others have a view, um, see it as important that the professional standards regime, not a matter for this parliament, uh, should be updated to make very clear where the boundaries and respective responsibilities are in this new regime of Parliament passes this uh, legislation. Absolutely, and, and that, that has to be important and remains important that, yes, aside, a solicitor will have duties to, to the court and, <coughs> um, you know, aside from, aside from looking at personal interest, and, the, the, you know, that, that has to be reflected in the rules going forward, absolutely. Questions of a May panel. Are any of you aware at present of examples where clients have been required to pay two separate fees from an award of damages, one to a claims management company and one to their solicitor? I, I'm not aware of any. Um, no. Likewise, I wouldn't. Not okay. to my personal knowledge. Okay, thank you. And, and, and finally, then, these particular provisions, there's much used phrase access to justice. Will, will they enhance access to justice? On my part, I have absolutely no doubt that the um, provisions of, of this bill collectively will enhance access to justice, and that includes um, the uh, provisions that we may come on to regarding group litigation, uh, but particularly part two of the bill uh, and qualified one-way cost shifting, its entire purpose uh, in terms of Sheriff, Taylor's, Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations was to enhance access to justice. I think we've all uh, expressed some concerns about the drafting and how that could be improved. But assuming that uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations are reflected fully in the bill, there's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that this will improve access to justice and most importantly, uh, or as of equal importance, it will do that which Sheriff Principal Taylor also said was his prime focus, and as I see the mischief of this bill, is to redress that um, imbalance in the relationship, the asymmetrical relationship that Law, uh, Prince Sheriff Principal Taylor spoke about as currently between pursuers of personal injury uh, claims and the extremely large, extremely powerful, extremely wealthy insurers who count their profits in billions of pounds. Thank you. Can I say that uh, APO strongly support the aims of this bill and have been waiting on this kind of legislation since the Taylor Report in 2013. Can I say that the most widely cited article in world jurisprudence is one by uh, Mark Gal Galanter in 1974 who wrote, Why the Haves Come Out Ahead in Litigation. And his critical point is that litigants can be divided into two categories. On the one side, you've got the one-shotter, and on the other side, you've got the repeat player. So if my car is rear-ended by someone else, I am a one-shotter. If I have to get involved in uh, litigation or dispute with a person who banged into me, I'm not dealing with a one-shotter, I'm dealing with a repeat player. And it doesn't just cover personal injury type cases, it covers landlord and tenants, 
um, private utilities, etc., against individuals. The repeat players have got distinct advantages. They are resource rich. They have uh, easy, well-established conduits to blue chip lawyers. They can decide what cases to settle. They can decide what cases to take to the Supreme Court. And we know from this place that in the asbestos wars that they're perfectly capable of doing that. But critically, and this is the point about this legislation, they have no real financial or emotional involvement in the dispute. Covering this in more depth, and you've taken quite a long time to explain that. But okay. Of course, it is a complex issue, and the yes. one-shotters can come in various forms, and that's what we're teasing out and hope to in this evidence Indeed. session. Indeed. Before we leave this session, well, can I ask perhaps a little bit more about the two separate, uh, or the possibility of two separate success fees from an award of damages? You all said you aren't aware of it, but it wouldn't be impossible for it to happen under the terms of the bill. Would that be correct? You, you, I'm not sure That's that where a claims management company might, um, might charge a fee, and then if they referred it to a solicitor, they may also charge a fee. It's not something I've considered <clears throat> in terms of the specific language of the, um, of the bill, um, and apologies for that. I think, uh, given what has been said, and as we know, the fact that, that there requires to be... Um, secondary legislation uh, under part one, that that's something that may need to be addressed then. But to answer your specific question, it's not something I've considered. Mm -hmm. Any other views from I Mr. Think, Castle I think, or Mr. Madam, Conley? I think you're correct. I think there would be a possibility. But of course, um, APEL's hope is that claims management companies wither on the vine. Uh, there's no real need for them. Um, they are a kind of dating agency that nobody needs. And once this clarity is introduced into the system, that there is, um, people should go straight to the solicitor who will okay. charge a single fee. So there's nothing you think to, to stop it? That may be something that needs to be looked at in the bill, perhaps? Yes, I think, Chair, mirror, mirroring my, my, my colleagues' views, I think that's something for secondary legislation. If there is a concern that that's a possibility, then I think that can be addressed in the, in, in the secondary legislation relating to fee charging. OK, we'll move on. Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, yes, I wonder if... Um, microphone's on. Yes. Is it? Um, I wonder if I could um, just ask, following on from um, my colleague, about um, his line of questioning, but more to do with the pursuer side of things. Um, pursuers who have suffered significant injury... Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on how they could be manage their future care needs if some of their damages award goes to paying solicitors' success fees. You're looking, I think, at section six of the uh, proposed bill. And uh, again, Taylor uh, adopted an evidence-based approach to this. Um, the the, the uh, position is that insofar as Cases. So if, if, may I just refer to section six, if, if you don't mind? Of course. The, um, if you're talking about care costs, you're really talking about cases which are probably worth over two million pounds or so. And the expectation, I would have to say, is that once the uh, new damages act comes into, pl comes into play, the expectation would be that in cases against institutions such as the NHS or the Motor Insurers Bureau or indeed uh, regulated insurance companies, the expectation would be that peri periodical allowances would be, uh, would be put in place. And in that event, there is no uh, tailor ex uh, excluded the possibility of any success fee being calculated on the future amount. So uh, I would have to say that the norm will be, in cases over £1 million, as in Section 6, that there will be, um, uh, there will be no calculation of a future success fee. Where, uh, and 
the, the uh, sec, subsection 6.6 says that, of course, the, the legislation has got to envisage two possibilities. First of all, there is a, a, an adjudication, so the, um, the court resolves matters, where it's a choice between a lump sum payment and periodic allowance, then the judge is going to have to be satisfied that the future element be paid as a lump sum. In cases where damages are obtained by settlement, an independent actuary will have to be uh, instructed by the pursuer's lawyer, and he will have to certify in the actuary's view that um, the future element be paid as a lump sum rather than in periodical payments. So very much the expectation will be once the periodical payment legislation comes in, is that there will be periodical payments rather than lump sum. If all of that falls by the wayside and we end up with a, a, a lump sum, Taylor's suggestion is that the amount of success fee is a once and for all 2.5% over £500,000. Uh, and I think the example he uses in um, his uh, in the report is a, a, where there is a future loss element, and the fee is uh, sorry, the, the amount recovered is a million pounds. It's uh, twenty percent for the first hundred thousand, um, ten percent for the next four hundred thousand, and then all the amount after that is at two point five percent. Now, can I say from a practical perspective, from a practitioner's expect perspective, that additional amount involves a most disputatious element of the litigation. There are constant disputes about life expectancy in, in particular, constant disputes about amounts of care, constant disputes about levels of care. And um, I agree with Taylor that a, two, a, a single lump sum, a single success fee of 2.5% over 500,000 uh, supplies sufficient incentive to keep going without um, over rewarding the lawyers involved. So can I just ask you how you feel about the argument that Scotland should follow England and Wales in protecting the future loss element of a claim? Um, from forming part of the success view calculation? I, maybe, maybe I can come in on yeah, that. Sure. Again, again um, Taylor looked at this in some detail. He, um, he looked at the possibility of looking or, or restricting um, a, a success fee to past damages only. And uh, I think he'd, he'd uh, uh, Sort of thought against that and thought, no, no, the, the, the better position would be to allow solicitors to charge a limited success fee on um, future damages. And, and I think the rationale largely for that was, um, one, as my colleague has said, um, you know, when you're looking at a, a future damages claim and continued care costs, that's really where the, uh, the bulk of the work goes in in these big value cases. They are hotly disputed and the vast majority of a solicitor's time looking at, at these types of cases would be focused on um, calculating and putting forward the future element. So he, he did not want to discourage um, solicitors not doing that work or not doing that work properly. Um, but the secondary point that I think Taylor had recognised um, was that anecdotally um, there was a suggestion that if you were if you were going to permit solicitors to charge a fee only on past losses, um, there was potentially an incentive um, to drag a case out for as long as possible um, so that more of, the, more of the compensation would be treated then as past losses. And that's clearly not in the best interests of the client in doing that. You want to achieve uh, and you want the framework, the, 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 the bill and the... And, and the uh, the framework of legislation to encourage um, to get to full and appropriate compensation, but as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And if I could add there, I mean, I think the overall purpose here is to achieve um, a, a fair balance with appropriate safeguards for the victim. 
Uh, Sheriff Taylor has spent a great deal of time looking at that and, and the recommendations as were contained in his report and as are now uh, reflected uh, in the bill, subject, of course, to Section 4 that requires that secondary legislation to set the parameters of the sliding scale of uh, fees that uh, both colleagues have spoken about, uh, I think it does strike that balance appropriately, whereby solicitors will be paid fairly for the extremely hard work that is put in to these extremely trying and difficult high-value cases, but in a way that the victims uh, the victim is properly protected. I think uh, the bill just strikes that balance correctly. Thank you. Um, I mean, yes. Just one final thing, where there is also a difference from England and Wales, uh, is that, of course, they are 25% of damages, uh, and Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations are for less. So, again, you know, everything that happens in England mm. and Wales doesn't necessarily mean it should find its way uh, up here. Okay. I think um, this bill strikes the right balance. Okay. So I, I take it from what everyone's been saying that you would dispute the fact that the success fee calculation rewards the solicitor not to an extent not justified by the amount of work carried out, which is what my colleague was saying as well. Yes, I would dispute would that. Dispute I think that. the balance is correct. You think the balance is correct? Okay. Um, can I ask you then, too, about the um, additional fee available in the current legal expenses system and whether it, you feel it sufficiently rewards solicitors when dealing with exceptionally complex cases? The, the uh, ad additional fee regime... Well, the, the recommendation of Taylor is that it is retained. I, I do have to say from practical experience that... Um, it depends on the particular golf course that you're playing on as to how the judge uh, deals with uh, applications for additional fees. Um, Perhaps give us an idea of, of the level of what that might be, because I, I haven't a clue what, what might that be, the additional fee. Well, well the, the additional fee relates to uh, judicial expenses uh -huh. only. And there is a, a separate number of heads, the, the kind of value. Uh, first of all, I'm speaking from memory here, uh, Ms Mackay, so value to the client, complexity, novelty of issues determined, number of documents, etc. So you, if you want an additional fee, you've got to say it goes above and beyond uh, the normal uh, run-of-the-mill type uh, lit litigation. Um, I think Taylor and Balance came, came to the conclusion that it's the best system that we have. Um, as I say, it does appear to me that there is not a great deal of uh, consistency uh, throughout Scotland applied to the application of additional fees, uh, but I'm not really sure how that can be addressed. It does strike me, looking at the uh, recommendations insofar as the auditors are concerned, I notice that the auditor of the Court of Session is to be obliged under the new regime to issue guidance as to um, how matters of expenses are to be dealt with. And it may be that the additional fee regime might be something which would benefit from guidance from the auditor of the mm. court of session. It, it, it sounds as if it might, because is that not at odds with a damage-based system to have an additional fee as well? I don't think it's necessarily at odds with the system because um, as, as Mr Conway said, the, the, the simple fact is that um, Sheriff Principal Taylor and his group looked at this, considered it in detail, and of course they are the ones with, with great knowledge of how the system practically currently works. Uh, but I, th I think the real issue here um, that we have to consider is uh, it's probably a case of the kind of horse in the car, because Sheriff Principal Taylor's overall view was that there was a need to introduce um, damage-based agreements as he has recommended in a way that will improve access to justice, will um, rebalance the asymmetrical relationship. That was his primary objective and his primary purpose for achieving that is the form of damage-based agreements that the bill mm. contains. The current regime of uh, additional fees is, as Mr Conway pointed out, quite opaque quite Byzantine uh, and very difficult to judge, to suggest that that is the solution to future damages 
just, just kind of misses the point. I think the reality is that when the damage-based agreements come in, the proper way of addressing the point uh, that you are um, raising, uh, Ms Mackay, is for the Civil Justice Council at that point to look at the big picture and decide, does that mean uh, additional fees now need to be changed? I think that's one for the Civil Justice Council down the line, not for us here to second guess how it's all going to work and maybe put something into primary or secondary legislation that will frustrate the entire purpose of Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just, just one further point on additional fee. An additional fee is entirely discretionary and on the basis of the, the trial judge or the court judge. Mm -hmm. So um, there is no gun. You, you, you would have to persuade the court that your mm -hmm. case was in some way exceptional or out with the norm um, mm -hmm. to persuade the judge to award an additional fee. And, and, and so, you know, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, at the outset of a case, if you had a view that a case was worth 200,000 or £2 million, there is no guarantee at all that um, the size of the damages or the settlement would, would result in a, a guaranteed additional fee. Many cases, um, applications are made for additional fees but are refused by the, mm. the trial judge or the court mm. on the basis that there was nothing out with the norm. Mm. So, um, so, so how often is it used? You know, how often is it, is it applied for? <sighs> Again, statistic. I mean, I'm not sure we would have the numbers. Just, um, just very but, but again, you know, you you have to persuade the court that in some way you've got an exceptional case that falls out with the norm. There are certain guidelines or heads that you have to make submissions to the trial judge on that the undue complexity or the mm -hmm. um, extensive efforts that you've made to settle a case, for example. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, the the court would only award an additional fee. Um, where they thought that the case was, mm -hmm. as I say, so something exceptional. it's really used, is what yeah. you're saying at the well, moment, the, 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 really used. It, it, yes, yes, it would be the exception yeah. rather than the norm, that, that's for sure. Okay. I wonder if I can assist simply from a practitioner perspective. It's certainly very rarely used in the Sheriff Court. Um, I, I suspect it's a bit more frequent in the Court of Session where cases tend, that there is a level of complexity. Uh, but in, in the Sheriff Court, uh, I mean, speaking personally, I think I've made an application, you know, in the last 10 years on about four or five occasions. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Liam Kerr, did you want to follow up? Yes, thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, so, uh, first of all, if I might go back to the basic premise of the legislation, if I may, um, the access to justice piece. Uh, Mr Conway, you said in your uh, submission that cases are not being brought or there's routine under settlement. Uh, and Mr Castle talked about people were prevented or dissuaded because of cost implications. And I think this is a very important point. So I'm just wondering, are you aware of actual research that shows the number of claims that are not being made or progressed and broken down by what those claims are that aren't being brought forward and why they're not being brought forward? There, there, there have been studies, and I can't put my, my hands on the, the, the references at the moment, but I would be happy to um, submit those um, following the session. But there, there, are, there have been a number of studies that say that, um, you know, as a whole, if you take 100% a, a of people who would have a valid claim, there's still statistically, um, a, 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 the majority of those have not pursued a damages claim or have decided not to pursue a damages claim. Now, there, there's, there's various, various rationales or options as to why that would be, um, and you know, the studies look at that to degree, but um, you know, it's difficult to give you first-hand evidence because, by the very nature, these clients are not coming to me as a practitioner um, to, to seek advice. So, um, but but there, there are studies, there are a number of studies that are saying, even now in Scotland and the UK, um, there are there are the majority of people who would, on the face of it, have a valid claim, choose not to advance um, advance a claim for damages. And, and and one of those must be a concern. Um, that actually, um, in advancing a claim, they are putting themselves at a significant risk of adverse expenses if they don't prove their case. Would you? Would you the, later, you know, the details I'm of happy that, that to would do be that. very helpful. Yes, it would, if you wouldn't mind, because I, whilst I suspect that uh, you're right, I, I'm concerned that the fundamental premise of the legislation, or the fundamental premise behind it, that costs are preventing access to justice, uh, may be groundless 
I, it may not, but we need some data because I understand that there's been a significant increase in PI claims in the last six years in Scotland, uh, which would tend to suggest that it's not to do with costs. Um, but perhaps I'll move on. If, is there a concern? Just, just uh, yes, of Sorry. course. Yeah. Um, it's impossible to have empirical data, Mr Kerr, as, as you can imagine. There was the study, I think, that uh, Mr Castle was referring to is by a, a well-known uh, legal researcher, Hazel Gen, Past Pathways to Justice in Scotland. But it's of some antiquity. I think it was um, the early 2000s that it was uh, uh, where she interviewed potential uh, litigants, etc. The... I, I, we, we've... Insofar as this particular legislation is concerned, I think it's important to, to remember that it deals with litigated cases. Now, we know that there has been an increase in claims registered in Scotland in claims registered with the Compensation Recovery Unit. But can I say that it's from a very low base? The figures which we've looked at and which can be made available to you show that uh, in England there were 926 claims registered last year, and that's 1,652 claims for every 100,000 persons in the population. And in Scotland, the figure was 973 for every 100,000. So we're still considerably lower than England. And the concern always is that uh, compensation culture, a shorthand for some kind of cheats charter or, 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 or fraud, etc. Now, it's, it's really, there, there are no figures anywhere to um, decide this argument one way or another, uh, it, 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 it seems to me. And so far as Quarks is concerned, what Quarks addresses, I, I, I should have explained this, the CRU statistics relate to all claims registered Mr Conway, if, forgive me interrupting, yes. just, I know we're coming on to Quox yes. later, so perhaps we can pick that up yes. in, in a second if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Um, just, uh, please, uh, if, if you don't sure. mind, because um, I, I noticed, Mr Kerr, that you, you, your question was premised on, and the suggestion is that the bill ought to be premised on uh, a need to increase the number of claims, and that is the basis upon which it will be judged if there's a need or not, if there's an increase in claims. Uh, then actually there is no problem with access to justice. Can I say that um, maybe there should be a, a deeper purpose for this bill and a greater purpose for this bill? Improving access to justice full stop is a good thing. That's what I would say is at the heart of this bill. Not looking at raw case numbers and taking a view as what do we say, as society, we ought to be doing. Improving access to justice is most certainly a good thing, and that's what's at the heart of this bill. More than that, of course, we now know from the very recent decision of the Supreme Court in relation to employment tribunal fees, um, the Unison case, it's not only a good thing that society should encourage, it's an absolute legal obligation on this parliament as much as any other parliament to improve access to justice. That's what this bill does, and it does it very well indeed. Maguire, but at the heart of the bill is cost and money. It's very much addressing that issue. And that's the point that um, I think Liam Kerr was making. I, I just want to pick up a point that uh, Rona Mackay was talking about. Is there a danger, when, when you look at the, the award end, uh, is there a danger that the courts might inflate future loss awards uh, to ensure that the funds uh, that have been given for care in the example given uh, are not going to be eroded by fees or costs? Is there a possibility of uh, award inflation, do you think? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, this, this question, I think, came up um, last week, uh, and I think eventually we, we got to the answer. I'll give an absolutely black and white, no holes barred answer. No, I don't think there's any prospect of the judiciary um, somehow deciding to work around the, the years and years of precedent that sets uh, the, the the, the parameters of damages. There is very clear basis upon which judges look at cases and make awards. They'll continue to follow those precedents. The prospects of them taking it upon themselves in some sort of nobly oblige fashion to increase damages, I, I think, is negligible. 
Can you, Mr Maguire, then help me, because uh, it's, it's a very long time since I practised in England, so I may be wrong on this, but didn't the Judicial College in England and Wales increase guide? When England and Wales did what they did, did, did the Judicial College not increase awards by 10%? Yes, yes I, I, I can help you with that, I think. Um, in England, remember, historically, um, when a claimant was pursuing a damages claim and they took out after the event insurance, um, not only the insurance premium, but also the uplift in terms of the um, fee agreement or the speculative element of the fee was recoverable from the insurers on success. And as part of the regime in England, where they decided um, we're not comfortable any longer with um, having the insurers pay for a success fee and for an insurance premium. The PRID pro quo was there was an instruction to judges and the judiciary to increase damages by 10% to, 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 um, to, to balance that out. In, in Scotland, we've never been able to recover a, an insurance premium if a client has taken out um, after the event insurance. Um, and as Mr Maguire said, there are well-founded principles in terms of how to calculate a damages claim that are used day in, day out by the, the, the bench in Scotland. Um, they're not going to depart from that. And indeed, if they did, I suspect they would be readily appealed. Um, and so I, I don't, um, like Mr Maguire, I don't see any prospect. I think that's a smokescreen. I just don't see any prospect at all. Um, which has been suggested in some of the submissions that somehow damages will um, damages awards will be increased, and um, that just isn't going to happen. The, uh, may I say that the, the tender-hearted judge or sheriff is not a creature that I recognise, Mr. Kerr. And uh, of course, they've taken a judicial oath to uh, uphold the law and to follow practice and precedent. They they will not be adding a little extra to the damages. Thank you. Perhaps to return to the question I didn't feel you had answered um, at all, Mr Conway, it was the first one, um, on how pursuers have suffered, who have suffered significant yes. injury can um, properly manage their future care needs if some of their damages go, the future damages go um, to, to pay solicitors or, or anyone else. Perhaps some of the other ones could do it. Now, you mentioned periodic payments being um, omitted from, from the agreement, but yes. inevitably somebody will fall through the net. So how do they meet their future costs if the amount that's been attributed to them, for them to look after themselves, and that's the sufficient amount deemed, um, deemed appropriate, if that's being, some of that is being given away or uh, have to be paid over to solicitors? Um, so maybe some of the other panels, if they could come in first, because you've already okay. had a shot at it. Um, Mr Maguire or Mr Castle? I mean, I think um, I've, I've made my view in that clear, that it comes down to the balance, but with appropriate safeguards. And I think that balance has been properly uh, struck. Um, I mean, I have certain views politically in a kind of industrial sense uh, on where this argument uh, is coming from. I've read that argument made by the insurance lobby that I'm happy to share now because it ties into uh, another recent development uh, south of the border that no doubt will come before this committee soon in relation to the discount rate, uh, as it's called. Uh, now, the, the, the discount rate, um, and I can deal with this now, or if you'd rather move on, it's up to you, but the, bo the bottom line uh, is that that particular line has been uh, promulgated by the insurance industry as part of their but attack on this anything? bill, um, and uh, I simply uh, don't accept that it's a legitimate argument. Yeah, I, th I think we're talking about not from the insurance perspective, from the client's perspective. They've well, had a severe personal injury. Well, They've if, been if, given a certain amount of, of I, money. I understand to look that, after and I'm, I'm happy there for And they're to, not getting that full Absolutely, and, and I'm happy there for to explain because that argument about the concern for uh, the victim comes from the insurance lobby. This is the same lobby uh, who recently um, decided that they were going to stand up uh, against the decision of the UK government to increase what's called the discount rate. Now, the discount rate applies to the most serious levels of claims. These are people who have had life-altering injuries and who receive, as in this case, damages that have to uh, see them through 
the rest of their life. The discount rate recognises that if somebody's getting money now, they'll be expected to invest it and that that will give some form of investment return over the years. It says that, to be fair to the insurance industry, <coughs> that um, some discount should be given, hence the term discount rate for the money being paid now. What the discount rate until now has, has overlooked is the incredibly low levels uh, of interest uh, and inflation that have been in the UK. Uh, and the Lord Chancellor uh, looked at that and made recommendations that it had to be changed, that the discount had to be reduced. To address exactly the point uh, you're making, uh, Madam Chair, to ensure that people get as much of their damages as they can. The insurance industry went to war. Uh, and they decided that that was completely uh, inappropriate, that they should not be paying more money, because by reducing the discount rate, you increase the money uh, insurers pay. They went to war, and the UK government backed off. That shows what's really behind these types of apparent concern for victims that's coming from the insurance lobby, that, that questions Can the I stop element. you there? My, my question is from somebody who is going to court, they're not familiar with things, they've got a huge injury. I'm not talking about the insurance lobby, I'm talking about that individual in court is awarded so much money to look after themselves for so many years to come and they're not getting the full amount. That's what they'll understand when they're in court. So could you please leave the insurance lobby out of it and answer that specifically? And, uh, I answered that question before and I'll answer it again. It comes down to what I think is a fair balance between the solicitor being paid fairly for the extremely um, pressured work involved in these most high value cases, but with safeguards to ensure that the victim, and that's what we are talking about here, victims of the most serious accidents, um, do not have to pay too much. It, the current bill, as it's currently drafted, I think strikes that fair balance with appropriate safeguards. I, I gave that answer before. Okay. Any other contribution, Mr Castle? And I think, um, if you don't mind, we'll move on after that, Mr Conway, because... You know. Yes, I, I, I haven't got much more to add there. I think, I think Taylor has looked at this. Uh, it is a concern that the committee are right to, to, to consider, and Taylor has considered this as well and had a look um, in contrast to the position in England and thought looking in the round and making a balanced decision as to the best interest of the client um, and, and the overall um, purpose in securing um, proper access to justice, Taylor has come down the side of... Um, Yes, he will permit a charge on future damages, but he, he reigns that right back. So, you know, and I think that's the position. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I could just ask one very quick, because I know Liam wants to come in for supplementary. How often do you, as um, the panel, advise the client not to proceed with the case because it's uneconomical? How often does that happen? Well, um, uh, as a, as a trade union uh, solicitor, uh, Thompson's uh, it's, it's a pity Dave Moxham can't be here. Um, but as a trade union solicitor, um, uh, it's, a, it's something that comes up quite regularly where we have to uh, advise our trade union uh, institutional clients whether or not they are able to support a case. And to do that, we have to look at uh, the prospects of success. And very, very hard decisions have to be made very regularly. So the notion, uh, and that shows, going back to what Sheriff Principal Taylor said about the asymmetrical relationship, that it applies not only to individual one-shotters, but there is just an imbalance in power and financial resources as between other organisations that uh, support victims, uh, including trade unions, as a regular part of what we do. So there's perhaps some empirical evidence to be had from that. Indeed. Um, Mr Castle? Yes, I think, I, think, I think that will happen on occasion. I, I, I'm actually just taken back to one of Mr Kerr's questions and was asking about evidence based for um, why clients wouldn't, wouldn't pursue a claim and whether the introduction of quarks would help. I think in terms of the mass membership, in terms of the, the, the solicitors in Scotland who are members of mass, they will certainly have um, numerous examples between them where a client has started on the process in terms of claiming damages and would have a, an offer which the solicitor was telling them was inadequate and uh, inappropriately low 
but depending on their funding arrangements, a client would take the decision, actually, I'm just not going to take the risk. I hear what you're saying as a solicitor, that actually I'm entitled to a greater award of compensation, but because of the funding regime I have, I'm simply not prepared to, to, to advance that with the risk of the risk of an adverse cost and a significant adverse cost award in the end. So and you may ad actually advise them not to in some circumstances. Yes, in some cases that you, you have to balance the the, 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 the the risk. You know, if it's a if it's a black and white case and there's there, there's absolute certainty, that's fine. But un unfortunately, in, in particularly when you're looking at litigation, there's very seldom a, a certain or a black and white case. Yeah. And briefly, Mr Conway, it will have to be briefly. Well, I, I'd agree. There's no problem about the stonewall certainties. We, we'll, we'll all take them on. We'll advise the clients to take them on. I, I have two particular cases which resonate with me. I, I don't think we've got time to go into the, the detail of that. Just a, you know, a kind of idea of how often you would advise people not to proceed because it was uneconomical. Uh, in the last couple of years, I have advised two one fatality not to proceed, which was an arguable case, a 50 percenter, and I have abandoned a case on day one because it was clear that the costs, if the case lost, was going to overwhelm the pursuer. Right, so two occasions only over a period of... Well, that, uh, that doesn't relate at all to the cases which don't get started. That's these, what I'm looking these, at. The oh, sorry, the cases that, 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 that don't get started. Economical. Well, I think all of us uh, in our daily uh, round, for lots of different reasons, but probably about one out of four, one out of five, don't get off the ground because prospects are not good enough. Right, thank you. Uh, uh, your supplementary, Liam MacArthur, and your line of questioning, yeah, please. Um, good morning. Just following up, Actually, probably the, the line of questioning that Liam Kerr advanced earlier on. Um, you will have seen the evidence that we had with the build team um, a Indeed. couple of weeks ago, and, and the figures I quoted there from yep. DWP data suggesting between 2008 uh, and 2011, um, the increase in PI uh, claims uh, south of the border was up 23% over that period, in Scotland up 7%. I think Sheriff, Taylor, Sheriff Principal Taylor. Uh, alluded to a compensation culture um, south of the border that was not reflected north of the border. Since when, between 2011 and 2016, we've seen an increase of 16% in Scotland in PI claims. Uh, in the UK, that's um, reduced dramatically to, to 4%. So, well, I take your point, Mr Maguire, about the general principles of the legislation. I think for those of us who are charged with the responsibility of scrutinising the legislation, sure. we need to understand the basis for it, the case that's made for it and we'll have Sheriff Principal Taylor um, with us uh, next month and that will be helpful. But it does appear to be the case that the picture has changed quite dramatically um, since, the, the, since the Taylor report was, was published. And getting an understanding of what those trends tell us about what's happening and the disincentives there are uh, or the obstacles there are to access to justice, I think, is a reasonable line of uh, argument for us to pursue. So I welcome your comments. Yes, well, Mr McCarthy, you're, you're right. Looking at the CRU figures and that, that's got to be the best case in terms of the numbers of um, personal injury claimants going forward. It is true to say that there has been a, um, a, a percentage increase in claims um, since Taylor did his review. But I think... And what, and what, and what, and it would be yes. interesting to know what your understanding of, of the rationale for okay. that, what's driven it? Well, well I, 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 think, I think there is an element of um, clients being more aware of their rights and willing to assert their rights even in that short period of time. But I think you've got to put these figures in context. If you're saying, well, there's a 17% rise or, or whatever, if you're putting them in context and certainly looking at them next to England and Wales, and Mr Conway referred to figures earlier, but if you're looking at the most recent CRU figures, um, you're still looking at um, 1,650 people in every 100,000 making a claim in England, whereas the, claim, the, the, the claims ratio in Scotland is still looking at under 1,000. It's 970 per 100,000 people. So the suggestion that um, you know, there, is full, there is now uh, something progressing towards full access to justice, I, I don't think it's necessarily borne out by those, 
by those figures. And certainly, we're still some way behind um, looking at our neighbours in England and Wales. If you're looking at a, um, you know, the, the, the ratio of um, claimants per 100,000 of the population. And referring back to my evidence earlier, as I said, there, are, there, there is some empirical studies that say actually the majority of people who um, have a valid claim, for whatever reason, choose still not to assert the rights to do so. And I think um, the, the main driver of this bill to actually you know, increase access to justice for valid claimants and to allow an increasing proportion of uh, valid claimants to assert their rights and get the full and proper compensation to their entitled to. I think that's that's a good aim and I think we as a society we should be we, we should be promulgating that. That's helpful. Can I move on? Yeah. I, there's a couple of other questions I but I'll, I think they're more related to quarks. So I'll bring them up um, uh, when we turn to that later. In relation to um, uh, actuary advice which the, the, the bill requires in certain instances. There seemed to be some confusion among some of the stakeholders we had from as to where the liability for, for paying for that advice came from. Right? The, the government bill team um, uh, insisted that that would fall to the pursuer solicitor. I just wondered whether that was your understanding and, and even if it is, do you think um, the bill would benefit from further clarity around precisely where that liability lies? It's, it's certainly it's my understanding it's what Taylor wanted and I thought that it would be covered by 6.2. Uh, the agreement must provide that the recipient of relevant legal services, including outlays incurred in providing the services, um, is to be paid by the provider. Hmm. Um, wh whether it, that could be spelled out in block capitals would be a matter for this committee, but certainly that's how people uh, are expecting the legislation to turn out. So you don't see that as a problem. The, the other issue that's been raised is the, the suggestion that the um, actuarial advice would be taken by the pursuer, in, uh, but absent um, his or her solicitor, yes. which seems slightly strange, but um, I would welcome, I think, your your guidance on whether or not this is a, a reasonable stance for, for the bill to take and indeed what the rationale for it is. I think uh, if, if you look at, again, going back to the Taylor report, what Taylor was concerned about was, uh, and of course, a success fee will only be paid if a lump sum is agreed. And what Taylor was concerned about was the written advice saying one thing and a nod and a wink to the client saying something different. And that was why he was trying to build in the protection for the client that the independent actuarial advice, that, sorry, the actuarial advice should be completely independent of the instructing solicitor. So you don't, you don't see a problem in, in, I, I, in enforcing um, this sort of arrangement? I think it needs yeah. to be clarified, certainly on behalf of Mass Scotland, a number of Mass members were concerned um, about if, if the arrangement fell on the, the, pursuers, the pursuer and the pursuer's firm, that's another additional cost that comes into the equation. So presumably that's going to be a recoverable cost at the end of the day, um, because if this is a, a, an essential step in process, then that ought to be treated as a recoverable cost on success uh, as, other, as other outlays would be. So that, that's one concern. The, the, the other slight concern that I have to say mass members had in Scotland, which, which may or may not be shared by my colleagues here, um, was the suggestion that, um, that the, the, uh, the, the actuary was the final determinant in terms of uh, which road you would go down. So um, in the context of a court action, I think the, the, the framework here is that um, all parties get an opportunity to feed in their, their wishes and hopes there would be an actuarial report and actually the judge would decide which was in the best interest and, all, and, and, and how the outcome was going to be. But of course, if you're settling a case before you get to court proceedings of, of, of a value, um, the suggestion or the framework at the moment says, um, you know, an actuary takes a view and that's the end of the matter. And, and looking at a, a, an individual client in terms of, um, you know, wishes and circumstances, I would have thought there has to be some mechanism there for, for clients' wishes to be taken into account. Now, um, 
Absolutely, there has to be safeguards as well, because the suggestion will be if this is being driven by the solicitor, then it's self-interest that's driving that because they want to charge a success fee in terms of the future element of uh, the damages if it's being paid as a lump sum. But uh, I'm, I'm, my members, the mass membership, are just slightly worried that there, there, there may be, for a whole number of reasons, an individual client where um, the advice is given that they might be slightly better off in terms of um, taking a periodical payment rather than a one-off lump sum. But if a client themselves takes the view, no, no, I, I would prefer to do it this way, at least there has to be a mechanism where their interests are taken into account and there's, there, there's, there's some cognizance taken of those. Um, quite how we arrange that um, will have to be a matter for further consideration and presumably secondary legislation as well, but that, 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 that was the view of the, the, certainly the mass membership. That, yeah. I, I don't think there's any reason that that can't happen, uh, Ryan. What, what can't happen is that a success fee is chargeable on the future element if the client insists that he wants a lump sum. So that's the, protect, the, the protection, if you like, is, is trying to force clients away from uh, lump sums. Uh, and preventing solicitors from getting a success fee if the advice is otherwise. Okay. Hey, uh, Mary. Hi, I just had some questions about the qualified one-way cost shifting because I think looking on the surface of it, I mean, obviously this isn't my job day to day and you'll see a full variety of cases. But I think the one thing that really struck me about it is that I understand that Sheriff Principal Taylor uh, brought put forward the justification that, you know, it was um, because of the David and Goliath <coughs> scenario uh, with the pursuit and the defenders. But it was really for those cases, uh, like, I believe that he said that that is the vast, that's the majority of cases that you would see. But it's really about those other cases, because I think, to me, it would strike me as being unfair that if I, as an individual, were taken to court by someone that, uh, and it found in my favour and not in favour of the pursuer, why should I have to pay for their uh, legal fees? But it was just really to get your views on, is that, realistic, uh, is that a realistic example? Or what are those examples? Uh, what examples can you give us to illustrate that scenario? I, I, th I think Sheriff Principal Taylor took the view that he did because it is the vast majority of cases, and I think, frankly, more, where uh, it will be an insurer that is acting for the defender. The prospect of um, any of us or any of uh, our, our colleagues in the entire profession bringing a personal injury claim uh, against a, a, an ordinary person is it's, it's virtually um, an impossible scenario. It's very, very unlikely because we have to be conscious of the fact that at the end of the day, if we're successful, uh, our clients must be able to get the money that the court says they're entitled to. Uh, and, of course, you would do that and bring a claim against uh, an ordinary member of the public unless, I think last week we spoke about a half billionaire. Well, we, we might contemplate it in that circumstance, but really in no other. So I, I take the point, but I think it's so unlikely uh, that we would probably be in danger of, you know, the old adage of hard cases making bad law kind of bleeding into the process. I think Chair of Principal Taylor got it right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd just be interested to hear if anybody else had any other examples there um, of those other cases that you know aren't quite that David and Goliath scenario. Or... Well, I, I mean, I did read the billionaire cyclist uh, example, and, and it's not so completely daft, if I may say. I can't remember which person uh, came up with the example, but um, it, it probably does illustrate as well how the. Um, ubiquity of insurance, because almost all, the, almost all of these people would be insured one way or another. I, I, the, the, the only example that I can think of might be in a kind of assault case, where uh, someone says, I assaulted them, and they, they, they say, I, I say, no, uh, you assaulted me. Now, you, you're, quite, you, you're right to say that if Quox comes in, uh, then I would lose the benefit of getting costs back from my, uh, the, the person who is suing me. Um, I would be able to raise a separate claim for my own damages, uh, uh, etc. But you know, I do have to say that the, we're in the realm of examples which are completely fanciful. Um, 
and it doesn't seem to me that th this th this is not what we should be legislating about, quite frankly. We should be legislating about the uh, litigation landscape as it is, so to speak. No, well, I thank you for those, those examples because, like I say, looking at it on the surface, that's just the one thing that jumped out to me. So that's where it's important to actually hear, well, what is happening and is that realistic the way it has been uh, uh, portrayed to us. Um, but together with quarks, and when you look at the, that combined with the introduction of the damages-based agreements as well, what do you think that will do to the level of claims that you'll, you'll see come in? And do you think that that would give rise to uh, more spurious claims as well, because it essentially takes away all the risk from the pursuer? I, I think it's very difficult to see how many more cases there will be. Um, I expect there will be an increase, and in many ways that, that, that's its purpose. <clears throat> Will it see um, an increase in spurious claims? Uh, and, I, and I'm very glad we're staying away from the term compensation culture uh, this week because it's one I, I bitterly oppose. Um, but I, I don't think uh, it will lead to an increase in spurious claims. I think actually that was addressed quite, quite well last week by, by Hamish Goodall. The protection is, uh, dare I say us, and our colleagues uh, in the profession because uh, although... Uh, the claimant uh, will not uh, lose out at the end of the day and require to pay uh, out legal fees to the other side. Uh, we will still not take forward spurious claims because we do, uh, as was mentioned earlier, have a duty to the court. We always have, we always will, and we take that very, very seriously. We have a duty to our profession. We always have, we always will, and we take that very seriously. <coughs> but you may say more or less than that. There's a financial imperative uh, although uh, the, the claimant won't uh, lose out, we uh, most certainly will in a spurious claim because we'll have wasted our money, we'll have wasted our time. Uh, and even running a spurious case will involve uh, perhaps court fees, expert uh, fees, uh, reports and things like that that we will simply lose. We're too busy running our businesses trying to pursue meritorious claims to waste time on frivolous ones. Last week, I think there was a, a supplementary question there that I'm happy to deal with now regarding uh, claims management companies and or uh, after the in event insurers who may um, incentivise solicitors to run uh, spurious cases, perhaps pay them to run spurious cases. Uh, uh, to, to try and be polite about, about this, that, that's just not the way that um, claims management companies operate. They don't pay solicitors anything and nor, they never have, nor will they do moving forward. That, that's just not a realistic scenario. Similarly, from an after-the-event insurance uh, perspective, um, there is no insurance out there currently that would um, um, pay a solicitor in that circumstance to run a frivolous case. And I don't think it would make financial sense for an insurer to do so, because when is an, you know, an insurer uh, is a betting shop, effectively, and in that scenario, I don't see how they would ever win. They would just constantly be paying out. So I don't think that's a realistic scenario either. Right, OK. okay. There, 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 there's concern expressed in some of the submissions as well about an increase or a, a fraud fraudsters charter and an increase in fraudulent claims and um, again I, I don't see that's realistic for a number of reasons solicitors you know we, we we've no interest whatsoever <coughs> in having any truck with fraudulent claims it doesn't benefit pursuer solicitors in the least but of course there are safeguards in the um, proposed legislation as it stands where um, quarks would fly off in terms of a case that was that, that was evidently fraudulent and, mm -hmm. and expenses would be paid. There's also provisions in here in terms of making awards against legal representatives. So if you are running a wholly spurious and fanciful claim, then um, there's the protection there. So I, I, I don't see I, do, I don't see the legislation as framed as um, you know being an open uh, an open invitation to to a huge number of spurious and fanciful claims because there, there you know there's protection here and actually um you know reputable solicitors don't have any interest in running these types of cases because they'll only lose money on them anyway so just to clarify that as well I would just say so you think that the, there's enough safeguards there anyway to prevent that from happening yes sir. May, may i uh, answer somewhat obliquely um and recommend the April campaign Can the Spam, which wants cold calling and nuisance texts banned. If there is an engine for fraud in this process, it is the text that people get 
telling them that they're entitled to £3,000, they have been in an accident, etc. It was part of the UK Conservative Party manifesto that it would be banned. I understand it's going through the financial, uh, in the House of Lords at present, the Financial Guidance and Courts Act. That simple measure would, it, it, I mean, there are a lot of people out there in Wonga land living paycheck to paycheck. They get a text, they get a phone call saying, um, you've been in an accident, and of course they get your mobile number from the repair garage, which has paid uh, a, a referral fee for your mobile number. And it must be very tempting when they're told, you must have had some kind of injury, uh, it's easy. You Mr Conway, okay. we are, we are um, pressed for time. If you could be succinct with your answers, that would be much can, appreciated. Can, no? can the spam? That yeah. is the answer to... A cheats charter. Okay. Very briefly. Very briefly thank you. Convener. Uh, the justification that uh, Murray Goujon has put up for Quox is the David v. Goliath situation. Uh, what about the situation where the pursuer is fully backed by, for example, a trade union? So effectively, you have a Goliath versus Goliath situation, and the arms have been equalised. Shouldn't Quox disapply in that situation? Well, I think, as I said earlier on, uh, Mr. Kerr, um, that's not a Goliath v. Goliath situation. Um, and um, Sheriff Principal Taylor took evidence widely and, and recognised that very point, that the um, absolute imbalance financially uh, between uh, an insurance company, uh, as I said earlier, who count their profits in billions compared to a, a trade union who have a fiduciary duty uh, to... Um, use their members' dues um, fairly, appropriately. Um, it's just not the same thing. But uh, if there were an equality of arms, should Quox disapply? If there was an uninsured defendant, for example? Well, I, I, I think that goes back to uh, Ms Goujon's point, and apologies for pronunciation, <laughs> point earlier on, uh, but that, that I think the prospect of, of there ever being a claim brought against uh, an uninsured person is, is virtually, or is negligible. Um, an example I could and perhaps should have given earlier that makes a point is, is dog bite cases. Um, and it, it echoes what, what Mr Conway said, that um, there are individuals who are insured through home insurance, pet insurance, whatever it may be, and where um, if, if somebody is injured uh, by their dog, we would look at that, and if there's insurance, we would first look and see if there is a, a, a proper claim, and if there is in those circumstances, we could take it forward. There are plenty of other people uh, who do not have that type of insurance and who in that circumstance, we simply could not and would not take a claim forward, and Quox is not going to change that. Quite a lot to cover. Um, Liam, if it's very brief. A couple of very brief questions on this. It would need um, to be just yeah, one. Uh, we've had, well, I'll bundle them together then, uh, convener. Okay, if you could. Um, Mr Conway, you talked about the need to look at litigation landscape as it is. Uh, you'll be aware again of the question I asked the bill came the, the other day, the number of cases or the proportion of cases um, where the defence will uh, seek the, uh, its legal costs uh, from the pursuit in, in event of um, a, a successful defence. I would be interested to know if you knew that figure. And likewise, could you shed some light on the financial memorandum from the uh, government which suggests defenders will have to balance the cost of going to court with the risk of losing a case. For example, if expenses in a case exceed the expected payout, insurers may settle rather than go to court, even if they consider it likely that they will be successful in that case. The financial memorandum then goes on to say that pursuers are unlikely to raise actions with little prospect of success. It's difficult to square those two. Can you perhaps square them for us? Well, I, I wonder if I can, first of all, if we're talking about quarks, the, the civil judicial statistics, which are about cases raised, show no increase over the past five or six years or so, and probably a, a, a decrease. So, uh, and of course, that, those are the cases that quarks will apply to. The CRU figures are the whole big um, uh, balloon, so to speak. Uh, and it's only the litigated cases that quarks uh, will, 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 will apply to. It, it is, uh, it, uh, if you're asking, Will, will there be situations where insurers will make an economic decision 
to settle a case rather than run it, that happens at present, Ms. MacArthur. You get nuisance value uh, settlements, you get nuisance value offers. Um, they they are, are, are in, in significant cases, they're not going to make, uh, the, you know, the, these You cases, don't think there'll be more of those as a result of the provisions brought forward by this bill? It, it, I have to, it, it's impossible. So, 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 succinctly, please, Mr. O'Connor. It's impossible to know exactly. That there is, if, if that's enough for you, that there will be more cases raised. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I can try to uh, If it would assist, uh, Madam Chairman, because I, I think the two quotes are referring to two entirely different parts of the claim process. Uh, there is the uh, compulsory pre-action protocol that was spoken about last week and that I'm sure uh, members know about uh, that, that a claim must go through before a court action is raised. Uh, and then there's the litigation itself. My reading of those two quotes is that the first relates only to that compulsory pre-action protocol where they may settle um, before going to court. Uh, and whereas the, the second quote re relates to the prospect of uh, solicitors advising their claimant pursuers uh, to proceed and to raise a court action where there's little prospects of success. That, that's how it squares. And we uh, would continue uh, with the advent of quarks not to raise those frivolous cases. So in terms of the cost to the insurance industry... Um, I'm grateful to you shedding light on the government's own financial memorandum because they weren't able to do it la the, the other week. But, but from, your, from your expectation, would it be the case that there'll be a higher proportion of, of cases in that pre -act, through that pre-action protocol that will, that will settle in the terms set out in, in paragraph 59 of the financial memorandum? I mean, it comes back to some of the questions earlier. It's impossible to tell. Um, but, but again, the question becomes... Are we looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope? Because it strikes me that some challenges to this bill and the entire notion behind it is that all additional claims are frivolous, are bad, are um, arising out of, and again, I'm going to use it disparagingly, the compensation culture that doesn't exist. I would utterly challenge that. I would suggest that if there are more claims, they, they, they are likely, the vast majority, all of them, are more likely to be meritorious claims. So if that increases, that's a good thing. If there's more meritorious claims, that's what the bill's there to do. That's what we should encourage. It goes back to my point about our primary purpose is to improve access to justice. Okay. Um, I know from the recent submissions there are concerns um, about the, the tests and the bill which would determine where Co uh, Cox's uh, protection is lost. Could you outline some of these concerns? Also, uh, if you have any sub specific suggestions about how the test could be improved, if you could um, talk to that, and also the consequences if these concerns aren't addressed. Who would like to start? Um, to start, the, the it's, not, it's not just cases which are not taken, although there are meritorious cases in the middle which are not taken. What the expenses rule does is create a... Uh, it, the expenses rule as presently advised is a spectre. Actually, please, we're running out of time, Mr Conway, to the three tests. That's fraudulent behaviour, reasonableness and abusive process. I, I, th I think I do have to make this point. Um, well, if you could do it briefly. I will, I will make it briefly. The expenses rule bleeds to, uh, into every part of the litigation process because at every part of the process is the spectre of an adverse award of expenses, bankruptcy, ruination for the pursuer. High value case, 50% chance uh, of winning, 50% chance of losing. Uh, what advice, uh, and a low ball tender comes in, We've got the picture. We understand what's in state. Could you cut to the chase, please, Mr Conway? Well, let me just, if, if we can turn to... It, and perhaps someone else can answer if you want to reflect on your notes. I think actually having read yes, all three, um, and indeed uh, the STC and various other trade union submissions as well, the concerns relate to uh, the current drafting of uh, um, 4A makes a fraudulent representation in connection with the proceedings. Um, and uh, C, otherwise conducts proceedings in a manner 
that the court considers are linked to an abuse of uh, process. Um, the concerns, I think, echoed, uh, albeit phrased slightly differently, uh, are the same in relation to both tests. And I'll give one very brief um, caveat. First, that it's all about certainty. The entire purpose behind the uh, Sheriff uh, Principal Taylor's recommendations are the need for certainty. The current drafting, we would all say, and all the trade unions would say, does not provide that certainty. It is an open invitation to challenges uh, and to what's called satellite litigation. And we would say that both of those tests, A and C, require to be tightened. Um, the problem with uh, makes A fraudulent representation is that um, it could be a single comment that's entirely peripheral to the, 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 the centre point, the significant material part of the claim. One could compare that to the equivalent test in the English rules that have been here since 2013 that talks about um, a, the, the entire claim being fundamentally dishonest. That's a level we have to get at to reach the very high bar, again, to refer back to Sheriff Principal Taylor, that is required. It has to be uh, an error submission, not peripheral, and something that is at the heart of the claim. So, you know, for, for alternative forms of words, uh, there, there are greater minds than mine when it comes to drafting, um, but, um, you know, it, it could be something along the lines of, um, uh, you know, that the... Um, that it has to indicate that the, the entire claim is fraudulent or a material aspect of it. There has to be a material aspect, a material a proportionality point. Um, as for um, C, I think everyone that's commented on this section makes the same point that um, Sheriff Principal Taylor uh, recommended that quarks be removed if the Weddensbury test of reasonableness uh, is met. I don't need to go over that because um, it's in every submission and it was canvassed at length last week. Our submission is that um, uh, the current drafting does not meet that test. I know there is a suggestion that um, the additional words at the end of that um, amounts to an abuse of process may be the saving grace. I think there's a suggestion that um, there must not only be a unreasonable conduct but also an abuse of process that takes it to the Weddensbury level. That may be the case, but what we all want to avoid is hours upon hours upon hours of satellite litigation. It could be framed more tightly, and to make things simpler for everything, everyone, it ought to be framed more tightly. Uh, and simply a statutory definition uh, of what is meant by unreasonable conduct ought to be in the bill and ought to be verbatim, basically, the Weddensbury test. Thank you. That's comprehensive. Anything to add to that? Uh, the other members happy with that explanation? <coughs> Well, just, Madam Chair, it's in the April call for evidence submission. The suggested phraseology as far as fraudulent representation is concerned at pages four and five. Yeah, thank you. And Mr Castle? That's great. Mary? Thank you, um, Convener. Um, I, I will be um, very brief. I, I want to direct my questions to um, Mr Maguire. In, in the absence of, of Dave Moxon from, from the STUC, um, I wonder if you could perhaps give us some assistance on the issue of, of unions. Um, and I wonder if you could perhaps give us a, a bit of detail about the impact that um, unions having to pay court fees up front currently have on both the union and, and the union member. And I'll roll my questions into one because it may make it easier for you. And whether currently unions recover, recover fees from, from members. Um, and do you think there could ever be in, in the future a, a, a situation where um, unions would con consider referring members to no win, no fee so solicitors. And there, there has also been concerns raised in the submissions from both the STUC and, and I believe from um, Thompson's that the, the bill should expressly state that Section 10 does not apply to trade unions. Mr Maguire. Thank you very much for that <laughs> very lengthy question. Um, I, of course, have neither the hair nor the beard to stand in the stead of Dave Moxon, mm. but I'll do my best to, to answer on his behalf. And perhaps we can deal with some of the, the simpler mm -hmm. questions more quickly. Um, Section 10 um, should absolutely not apply uh, to trade unions. I think, actually, it's perfectly clear from um, Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations and, indeed, from the Scottish mm -hmm. Government's response to it that it's intended only to apply to um, 
I guess the term would be litigation, um, mm. uh, venture capitalists, and by no means mm. trade unions. Uh, so I would say that, yes, as currently drafted, there's an argument, again, and it's back to the, the, the clarity of mm. drafting, there's an argument it doesn't because of the term but has financial interest in, yeah. and there's an argument that trade unions do not have such yeah. a financial interest in. But let's not invite satellite litigation. Let's just have an absolutely clear black and white interpretation section. So I think that deals with that. Um, here's, here's an even easier one. Do trade unions, would trade unions ever take court fees from their members? No, trade union members always receive 100% of their damages. Would trade unions ever refer their members to a claims company? Uh, I, I think the forefathers in the trade union movement would be turning in their graves at that prospect. It is an unequivocal no. So we do have to find a system where recognising that it's not Goliath v Goliath, that trade unions who are more and more under financial pressure these days because of the sweeping aggressive changes of laws uh, south of the border, many of which is aimed specifically at trade union finances, that it becomes more and more difficult to operate. Uh, and court fees places an additional financial burden on trade unions. It's that plain and it's that simple. Um, because the current model of court fees is one that's described in, in Thompson's paper and the STC's paper as a pay-as-you-go model. That as soon as you want to go to court, you have to get your chequebook out and pay for different stages of the process. Uh, if and when the trade union client is successful, that money comes back. But what it represents is a, and it is significant, I use the word deliberately, it's a significant cash flow strain mm. on the trade unions when they could least do with that problem. We then look at the very recent uh, decision in the Supreme Court that relates to employment tribunal fees. And it's kind of interesting that employment tribunal fees were roundly accepted as inappropriate and an absolute barrier to access to justice, and so they were. But court fees has been a bit of a kind of overlooked barrier. It is an absolute and real barrier and is becoming one more and more as trade union finances become more and more strained. So what is proposed by both Thompsons and by the SDUC is simply a remodelling. No more, no less, no reduction in the overall income to the Scottish Government or the Civil Justice Fund. Simply a different way of paying those court fees. That is by moving from a pay-as-you-go model to a deferred payment at the end. In other words, we would say simply treating court fees in exactly the same way as defenders' costs are treated mm -hmm. in this bill. And we say that in fact because this bill is dealing with access to justice and because now especially given the Supreme Court judgment, this is a perfect opportunity to do that. Mm. Okay, that's been very helpful. Thank you for that and I won't mm. ask any more well, questions. We, we should say Dave Moxon, Deputy General Secretary of Trade Union, was due to appear in and wasn't able to for ill health reasons. So thank you very much for answering <laughs> on his behalf. Can we move to our final um, set of questions, Ben Wallace? Uh, sorry, Ben McPherson. Convener, uh, good morning. Good morning. The, the, this matter has been uh, touched on briefly by uh, a few of you already, but I think it's, it's an important area to just get clarity on and get your thoughts on. Do you think that uh, there may be consequences of not introducing formal regulation of claims management companies as part of the bill? Well, yeah, indeed, I, I guess it was your final couple of words that, that caused me to hesitate as part of the bill. There is an absolute need to regulate claims management companies. Um, but there is a, a, an even greater, I think, at this moment need for this bill to be taken forward. And I would not want one to derail or at least put on hold the other. So absolutely, we must regulate the companies. But if that's going to be a year down the line, and this bill comes into force in the meantime, so be it. But uh, just for clarity, um, it would be uh, more beneficial if they could be done in tandem, for example. If it could be done right now, yes, that, that is a better scenario, but I don't see how the parliamentary timetable permits that. Okay. But it's not for me. <laughs> and um, I think, it, it, does anyone else have anything to say on that? Because it, it's, it's quite important, and I know you touched on the matter before, Mr Conway. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, I would, I would agree with Ms McGuire, in fact, but I do understand that the matter is un, under to be under review within the next uh, few months, basically, in this place. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So, and I, I do world, the regulations would be in at the same time. Um, but we've already waited since 2013 for this legislation. Please get on with it. And then we, you know, deal with the claims management companies as and when. So the clear view is proceed and, uh, yes, and take action yep. as quickly as possible. Otherwise. Okay, thank you. And, and just lastly, because um, I think definitions are important, as was touched on earlier, do you consider that the definition of uh, relevant legal services at 1.2 in the, in the bill uh, is wide enough to catch claims management companies? Basically, so that their no when, no fee arrangements would have to meet the same requirements in the bill. I think it ought to be, but again, going back to all my other comments about the need for clarity and to um, avoid satellite litigation, the sensible thing would be to have some form of interpretation section there confirming it, because it certainly ought to capture uh, those arrangements too. But, but you would say that specific uh, definition, uh, a tightening of the definition, to use your phraseology earlier, would, would be advantageous? Would be helpful. Yeah. You, you would never like to predict uh, ways in which people you know, might worm their way through legislation, but it does seem to me that um, 2A, subject of civil proceedings, and 2B, in relation to which such proceedings are in contemplation, would, would clearly attract claims management company activities. Okay, so there's a slight divergence there. But do, do you think that... Um, because, uh, I mean... Uh, Thompson's and the trade union movement are part of a far wider uh, or, um, organisation and movement and the amount of satellite litigation that we've seen over the years because of bills exactly like this makes me extremely cautious. So if, you know, at stage two or stage three, you know, a one-liner could be added to absolutely put it beyond doubt, that would be my preferred route. OK. Anything else to add on that point? OK, thank you, Kavina. That concludes our line of questioning. Can I thank the panel members very much for attending? That was a very worthwhile session. Agenda item number two is the Justice Committee on Policing. Uh, and we will have feedback from the, the convener, Mary Fee, on the meeting of the 14th of September 2017. And I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. Mary. Convener, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 14th of September when it took evidence from Ian Livingston, Deputy Chief Constable Designate of Police Scotland, and Nicola Marchant, Deputy Chair of the Scottish Police Authority on Police Scotland's internal complaints procedures. And the subcommittee was pleased to hear that Police Scotland has shifted its focus from process to people to ensure that police officers and staff are better supported and have more confidence in Police Scotland's complaints procedure. And this includes for the first time the introduction of a whistleblowing policy as well as a wellbeing initiative which aims to support staff to deal with a wide range of issues, whether these are personal, procedural or related to conduct. And the subcommittee looks forward to hearing more detail on how these will impact on supporting officers and staff in feeling confident that the issues they raise will be dealt with effectively and confidentially. And the next meeting of the subcommittee is scheduled for Thursday the 28th of September when it will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice on governance of the Scottish Police Authority. And I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Are there any questions for Mary? No questions. no questions. Just comment that we're, we're pleased the focus has moved from pros process to, to people. people yeah. We'll see if it's actually realised. Yes. That'll be the test. Yes, that'll be the test. Thank you very much for that. We now move into private session. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 19th of September 2017, when we'll continue our evidence taking on the Civil Litigation Bill. And I suspend briefly to allow the public gallery to clear. It's gone. <laughs> okay, comfort break, everyone.